Hello and welcome to FACT's webinar called Rotational Grazing 101. Our guest presenter today is Steve Gabriel. I am Larissa McKenna, FACT's Humane Farming Program Director, and I will be moderating this session. Thank you for joining us. Before we dive in, let me just take a minute or two for a few quick introductions. Food Animal Concerns Trust, or FACT, we are a national nonprofit organization that's headquartered in Illinois. We work to ensure that all food producing animals are raised in a healthy and humane manner. We accomplish this by supporting humane farmers such as yourselves, promoting policies that make food from animals safe and healthy to eat, and helping consumers make inf informed food choices. Um, along with my wonderful colleague, Samantha, I help run uh, FACT's Humane Farming Program, and we work with livestock and poultry farmers from all across the country. We offer grants, scholarships, training courses, mentorship, and of course, webinars on a variety of very fascinating topics. So I invite you to visit our website at foodanimalconcernstrust.org to learn all about our farmer services. This time I'm very pleased to introduce our esteemed presenter, Steve Gabriel. Steve's been with us in, in the past for um, a series of webinars. We're always so happy when he comes back. Steve is an agroforestry extension specialist for the uh, Cornell Small Farms Program. He's also written several books about silvopasture. Along with his family, Steve operates Wellspring Forest Farm and School in the Finger Lakes region of New York. So we're really lucky to have Steve with us today. Uh, so I think at this point, I will turn the floor over to you, Steve, so that you may begin your presentation. Take it away. Okay, great. Thanks, Larissa. Mm -hmm. Everybody, thanks for tuning in today. Glad to have you here. Hopefully uh, the weather's treating you all right. We finally got a little bit of snow here in central New York. It's been a very mild, muddy year, which is always challenging when you're working with livestock. But uh, yeah, happy to have a little, little snow and hopefully some frozen ground here soon. Let me just share my screen. Um, so this is one of a couple of talks I'm doing this uh, new year. Um, encourage you to check those out and join us if you're interested. We're going to focus on um, Katahdin sheep um, as a breed uh, in February and then in March do a webinar about um, grazing in relationship to riparian or, or sort of water areas. But I wanted to offer a rotational grazing 101 webinar. Um, as, a, as a, a broad overview of a lot of things that, you know, we've personally learned and 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 thought about in terms of, of how to get started with grazing and how to always continuously improve. I mean, this is a practice that um, feels lifelong in its in its pursuit, uh, like most of farming, <laughs> where we're just kind of learning every year and trying to trying to prove things a little bit. Um, so our farm uh, works mostly with sheep. We've had ducks, we've had chickens uh, in the past. We, I've managed cows, I've managed pigs, I've managed goats. I've worked with all the different animals. Um, we've been on this farm for 12 seasons now and, um, and I've been farming for about 20 years. So experience with a lot of animals. Ultimately, we settled on sheep for our landscape uh, for some particular reasons, which I'll try to touch on as we go through this. But um, yeah, feel free to uh, pop questions and we'll do our best to answer those as well. Lots of great questions coming in when you all registered um, too. So the intent of this is again, to be kind of a broad overview and to share um, some of the broad concepts, some of the important things to consider, uh, different forks in the road for decision-making, talk about planning and, and actually some grazing calculations um, and and then some, some really important strategies to uh, that we found really effective in the ways that we focus our, our limited time and energy when we actually improve our, our grazing practice. So when we say uh, rotational grazing, one of the, our first questions should be, what do we mean by this? And this um, image comes to us from the USDA. Um, pretty simple uh, diagram here showing livestock being regularly moved showing grazing paddocks being rested. So the moving, the movement of livestock in and out of paddocks, the rest period, and that rest period allowing the plants to recover and provide all sorts of benefits for soil and carbon and uh, ecosystem services, but primarily also to regenerate themselves so that there's adequate food for the next round of grazing. And that's what we wanna keep focusing on and improving. So we're gonna talk about ideals, but let's keep in mind we're all human, we're all learning, our landscapes are in various stages of, ecological succession. And so um, we can always improve and, and we're probably always doing some things right as we go. So to zoom in a little bit more, I want to emphasize that um, this is the way I think of rotational grazing um, in its broadest sense. So again, first giving animals access to limited space, which we would call a paddock in a sense, 
for a set amount of time. Uh, that paddock should have adequate amount of food for that residency time. So um, maybe that seems obvious, but a lot of times we'll put animals in a pasture and not necessarily pay attention or be set up or prepared for that move so that we're not keeping them in there for too long. And that can be hours, that could be days. And if we're not adequately preparing uh, our pas paddocks so that the animals can um, get enough sustenance off of them, then we're starting to get into overgrazing and that can be a slippery slope. Um, as you overgraze pastures, they become harder and harder to recover and restore. So then of course, after grazing, we exclude animals from the paddock so it can rest and recover. And those res residencies and rest periods, and a lot of new grazers especially ask, well, what are these numbers? You know, How many days do I need to rest my pasture? Uh, how many animals can I have in a paddock? How big should my paddocks be? We're gonna talk about a few of those and you're gonna see in any of that math, there's a lot of variability in it. So the best you can do is some planning, some calculations to understand the situation, and then a lot of on-site observation as we go. So we have tools in our grazing toolkit, lots of different things. The primary, to, there's two tools we are primarily working with, and our goal as good grazing managers is to, is to be the conductor of the orchestra. We're getting the right people, or I should say the right animals, to the right place at the right time and moving them on at the right time so that it's harmonious like a nice symphony. So our fencing is a huge tool that allows us to both keep animals in paddocks where we want them, but also keep them out of spaces we don't want them in. And that could be, again, areas that we're looking to rest and recover before the next grazing event. It could also be things we've planted or want to integrate into pasture that may not be ready to interact with animals, um, such as the elderberry here on the right that we have as a hedgerow, uh, uh, one example on our farm. We do a lot of tree planting. So we use our fencing not only to keep animals in a place, but to keep them off of things until they're ready to be integrated with the livestock. So fencing is a really amazing tool and it's it's only gotten more um, innovative. And in, you know, in my lifetime, I've been uh, the beneficiary of uh, sort of all this technology around fencing that's made it more easier than ever to do rotational grazing. So my grandfather was a farmer in central Illinois and kept all sorts of different animals. And fencing then was was hard posts in the ground with, you know, barbed wire or um, uh, welded wire came, came later on. But, um, you know, uh, permanent fencing that took a lot of time, labor and energy to construct. And there are foldable fences, there are reels. Um, there's all sorts of different... Uh, nuances within those that you can play with. There's even coming into the US now um, virtual fence technology, which I think is really interesting. Some friends of mine are engaged with that and working on that, where you can actually um, put a collar around the animal and train them and, um, and essentially have no fencing whatsoever. And there's it's, it's pretty impressive when you dig into the success of that and how the system works and, and the technology there. Um, so lots of options with fencing. That's our first uh, tool. And our, our second tool is really the animals. And I think the most important thing with grazing is to see them ecologically in the landscape. They are uh, disturbing the landscape. And disturbance can be, that is an ecological name uh, or a term. Um, that can be seen as a positive force on the uh, ecosystem or a negative force. Um, so really our goal as grazers is to have it be a positive force time and time again um, on the landscape. And this can look a lot of different ways. So we can think of that just in sort of our our main motivation at our farm to, for getting grazing animals was really pasture renovation, building soil health, increasing water, water infiltration, managing the vegetation. We didn't want to spend all of our time um, sitting on a mower to keep open pasture. Um, and so just in the act of grazing, rotational grazing, you're, you're creating disturbances which lead to healthier pastures. But there's a lot of other ways folks think of utilizing animals as pest control, um, to remove unwanted vegetation, to root up the soil or to um, change the composition of soil or vegetation in a site, you know, to thin out trees. You can see here, there's a goats in the woods project picture there on the top left from a, a former Cornell grant looking at using goats to help remove undesirable tree species in the forest. So there's lots of ways that animals are that force. And if we think about them as that, then we can put them to work in good ways that 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 mirror uh, our goals and, and make them uh, enjoy their time in the landscape. And we can also be weary of the possibility, which is very likely that if we don't uh, pay attention to those things, we're gonna do damage. And all, all grazing animals, uh, can uh, be a force of, of damage on the landscape. So um, this is a chart from the Silvo Pasture book. Um, if you want to check out the website, it's just silvopasturebook.com. Um, and I'll put that there. And um, 
uh, there's a mailing list there if you want to stay in touch and get information as we uh, I'll, tell, I'll talk about some resources we're going to be posting things like that relevant to this talk um, you can sign up there but um, this is from the book and a lot of the uh, charts and things are, are things that I, I grab from the book but just to show kind of different um, tasks on the landscape that animals can do um, and and do well or not do at all uh, depending on again your goals and, and what you're looking for as you think about a grazing system um, and if you're interested, you know, if you haven't really settled on a type of animal, I'd recommend a previous fact webinar uh, that I did called Right Animal, Right Place, Right Time. And that webinar uh, really gets into the nuances of different, different types of animals and the different, you know, sort of working relationship they can have with the land. So at this point, I want to just preface that a lot of the grazing conversation, when we're talking about grazing, we're talking about calculations, um, we're often really focused on uh, ruminant animals that can utilize a wide array of green forages. We could think about those as grasses, legumes, forbs, you know, flowering plants, tree fodders, things like that. Um, and within their ability to utilize that forage is always the ability of us as grazers to increase the volume of that forage exponentially. And we can improve the quality and the quantity of our pastures as we go. When we talk about monogastrics, essentially pigs and poultry, it's kind of a whole nother fork in the road. And so keep in mind that we can think of there's a grazing practice, but then there's a grazing practice with supplemental uh, feed that is a necessary component of that. Um, it is possible. There's a few examples out there of folks who are um, feeding pigs and poultry entirely off the landscape, but there's there's a lot of ifs, ands, and buts, and stars, and asterisks about that and what that looks like. And often it, it requires planting and um, feeding out high protein grains and things like that. So, so strive for that, but just know that when we're talking about grazing and a lot of these grazing patterns, we're, we're thinking in the back of our heads about ruminants, but a lot of the principles and benefits apply to pigs and poultry. It just means um, they can be a grazing force, but also likely need a supplement um, showing up. And I always like to see supplements, whether I'm thinking of a supplement of grain that we might feed our chickens if we're rotating them around, or a supplement of hay that I'm buying for my neighbor to feed the sheep. That is me investing in nutrients from somewhere else, and I'm bringing them onto the farm. And so there's nothing wrong with that. It's just a different calculation when we think about where our food's coming from for our animals and how we're going to manage that. And I want to mention, if you're into pigs, really nice article from NC State that talks about um, rotational uh, management for, for pigs. And that's, that's a good example there of how it might differ from some of the things that we're going to zoom in a little more on in this talk. So... I mentioned the webinar, you know, it's really important in a grazing process to um, choose your animals wisely and, and choice is not just the type of animal as, as we just talked about in the last slide, but also that breed and also the culture of that uh, uh, group of animals that you might be purchasing or bringing onto the landscape um, or training over time. So if you have bought animals that are not used to rotational grazing systems, you're going to spend time training them and getting them used to that. Any animals that come new to the landscape, they're actually getting used to that specific landscape and the rotation, um, you know, over time. And But if they're completely unfamiliar with grazing, if they've been inside or in a confinement operation, and then they're coming into grazing operation, there's going to be a big learning curve there for them, as well as probably for you if you're new to it. So I think those elements are really important to consider. And we'll dive into that with specifically one breed of sheep, the Katahdin, which my and the folks who are going to be on the panel with me, you know, have found to really meet our needs. And we'll just describe that. But there are other, I know there's a Kuni Kuni webinar. In fact, has a number of webinars about specific breeds. And it's good to hear from growers, talk to people who have experience with these different animals and 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 choose wisely. Really invest in high quality stock if you're if you're um, buy, buying it in for the first time. So that local network is really key. Um, and so if I'm the only person raising Katahdin sheep within 100 miles, it's a lot harder to do a lot of things than the fact that, um, you know, we have five or six folks just, you know, in the immediate area that are also ready, raising Katahdins. So we found that to be really beneficial over the years. So let's talk about a little deeper than just that broad definition of rotational grazing. Okay, so continuous grazing would be big old box around the landscape available, let the animals roam wherever they are. There's no movement of them. There's no restricting of, of their access to certain areas so that can rest and recover. All right, so that's that's one piece. We're talking about rotational grazing. So as we move down that line, down that continuum, then the question is, well, what counts as rotational grazing? When are we actually maximizing our benefit? How do we know that moving them every day or every week or every month is 
is better or worse? What is our indicator? And I'm going to put that question to you all. And if anyone wants to chime in on the chat, you know, what counts as rotational grazing? What's a good parameter to think about if we're monitoring our pastures and making decisions on when to move our animals? I'll give you a second if anyone wants to <clears throat> throw ideas in there. <clears throat> Great. So seeing some folks say how fast that grass is regrowing, uh, forage height. Um, you know, technically rotating could be said there's no set time. What we're looking for, though, is not to um, uh, create issues uh, with our regrowth process and then ideally um, not, of course, uh, beyond that, go into an overgrazing situation. So um, we want to watch the grass. We got to look at what is going on in the pastures and learn those and find ways to uh, spend time, make time for ourselves to observe and, and, and pay attention to what's going on. Not all pastures are the same. They're all going to be a little bit different. Um, and they, they change year to year. And that's one of the challenges of the dynamic nature of, of pasture. So uh, when we think about grazing clovers uh, as a legume or, or generally gra most grasses, when the animal comes in and, and takes a bite of that, what's happening is that the um, the restructure, the regrowth is not coming from where those bites were taken. It's in the case of grasses, it's coming from the base where these new tillers are being formed and are shooting up and are taking the place of the ones that were bitten. And in this photo, you can see the brown ones that are previously bitten probably the last time this was grazed and are in the process of decomposing. So we call that the residual. And so those new tillers are going to be coming up. And uh, it's been shown that after generally speaking about three days, they're starting to come up. And if you leave your animals in there, they can come around and harvest, you know, another bite, especially if there's nothing else uh, of interest to them. So technically speaking, after that third day, you're starting to hit those grasses again. Now, if you move them on after that and they hit it twice, it's probably okay. But if they go back now uh, after six days and they hit it twice, now you're starting to really degenerate the ability of those grasses and other forages to, to regenerate and to regrow. And of course, if you do that time and time again, as with continuous grazing, some of those will be eliminated altogether, if not um, severely limited in their ability. So the, the stores of those grasses, the ability of them to re respond is related to that, how many nibbles the animals are going to get. And, and also, if you're thinking about setting up paddocks, if your animals are just have so much time in there, they can always go back and nip the new stuff. They may not be hitting some of the stuff you actually want them to graze. And so there's kind of a dance there. And so uh, a good rule of thumb to think about ideally is, you know, leave them in their a paddock, a given paddock for less than three days. And really, because life happens, there's a lot of different ways uh, that we may not be able to do that no more than five days. So we're eliminating that second opportunity for, for things to be nipped again by the grazing animals. So what we really do is spend time. And I always tell folks when I take them on pasture walks on our farm and we're talking about grazing, I say your best tool in addition to fencing and learning the animals is, is a lawn chair because you really need to spend time sitting in the pasture watching your animals graze, watching how they interact with the landscape. And you need to spend time looking at the different paddocks and understanding the way these forages are growing, how they're recovering from grazing, how the seasons have a, a market effect on those, that growth and that recovery, and how your animals are interacting with that system. And so you can do this through your own sort of passive observation and accumulating that knowledge over time. I, I uh, tend to take it as an opportunity to do uh, daily walks through the landscape that we're grazing, um, you know, with my family, with my kids. Morning or evening is a great time for us to just do that as, as a group and, um, and take some time to really pay attention, talk about what we're seeing. Oh, it's interesting that this paddock this year seems to be regrowing twice as fast as it did last year, or this paddock always seems to come back. Um, in lightning speed. And this one always seems to just sit there and hardly grow at all. You know, those kind of things can be really useful over time. Um, some folks find it useful to dig even deeper and actually uh, do some of the math and and try to um, <clears throat> calculate things, track things. And, and so uh, if you're not familiar, grazing charts are a tool that's out there. You can download um, grazing charts you can fill out by hand. Some people like to do that. This is an example on here from a, an app called Pasture Map. I don't know if anyone on the call is using that, but you know, sh chime in if you are and, and have any opinions about it, but that it can actually help you track it kind of from your phone. So depending on the level of, of detail and, and observation and data keeping you want to keep, you know, these, these can be really useful um, tools. So we observe those things. And then what we do is we plan how many animals are going to be in a given paddock, how long they're going to be there, 
how long those paddocks each need to rest and the number and the size of paddocks in our grazing operation. And this is the basis of what we might call a grazing plan where we actually have a map that we work with as a basis. Now, this is a plan and plans uh, in farming tend to go uh, in different directions than you probably imagined they go in every single season, right? So last year, we had another wonderful dry, uh, very quite, quite droughty year. And so we weren't able to do our kind of easy rotation every paddock. We had to skip a lot of paddocks. We had to move in different ways. We had to feed our sheep tree fodder. We had to kind of work with the system. The year before was one of the wettest years we've had in a long time. And the paddock, the pastures were just um, exploding. So we could have grazed any of these paddocks, but we had to choose the ones actually that had the highest quality forage and, and clip and mow a bunch of the other ones. So you know, every grazing season is is an opportunity for that kind of adventure, but we do make a plan so that we have a general sense of what we're working with and and that we can get like um, some feedback, right? So we, we look at the plan, we assess the plan, then we make changes for the next year. Um, and we always let our animals take the lead on this. So watching them, learning from them, uh, that seems to be, in my experience, the most important piece of this. Um, so, you know, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter if the plan, what the plan says, it matters what the animals need and, and that we're paying attention to them. So if you're not familiar, there are fact webinars I know that Fred Provenza has done. Um, our YouTube channel also has an interview I did with Fred Provenza, a really wonderful speaker, researcher, author, um, talks a lot about the nutritional wisdom of animals. There's a lot to dig into there. Definitely important knowledge if you're going to do grazing of any type. But one of the things I want to focus on now is just that at any given moment, in any given paddock, at any given time, each of your animals has a, a unique need for its meeting its nutritional and dietary requirements. And that need is ever changing. So they're constantly trying to find that balance. So you can see in this picture here, these sheep are just let into this paddock. Some of them are going straight for these little black locust trees and starting to strip that high protein um, forage. Uh, some are going for grasses, some are going for clovers. They're all kind of looking and sampling. And of course the animals take the rounds. They sort of see what the options are and then they might go back to a spot and, and kind of make make work of the, of the grazing, you know. Um, system. So um, keep in mind, there's, there is no such thing as this perfect ration that every animal needs at any given time. And so we, what we want to create for them in a grazing environment is, is diversity, a lot of options out there for them. So when we try to think about the pastures we want to spend our energy on um, renovating, it's those that are most depleted, most um, slow to recover after grazing, and then least diverse in terms of their species composition. And those are the ones we try to target first as we increase the types of forages we see and also the types of trees we can potentially provide as, as fodder. And um, I, I love to always incorporate trees and, and it's always really fascinating to watch the animals and how they uh, interact with the woody stuff as well. Um, and so just one example here, um, willow is a wonderful tree fodder, has a lot of other wonderful benefits to, to be in our grazing ecosystems, but the willow um, leaf material is high in condensed tannins, which will um, really limit intake. And so it's a really good example of something where you can really hone in on how different animals are, are choosing sort of different amounts or different types of food at any given time. Because I'll see some of our sheep gnawing on this for 20 minutes and some will take one nibble and say, oh, I don't need that tannin right now. I'm going to move on. And, and tannins have been associated with lowering parasite um, activity in, in the guts of rumens. And so that's one of the benefits, uh, one of the reasons we want our sheep to have access to that as a forage. So we watch the grasses grow. We watch the forages grow. And keep in mind, as grasses grow, what they're going through after a grazing event is a regrowth period. And one of our challenges is, is going from this phase one where we have initially very slow growth as the root reserves are building up energy and starting to put out those new tillers and grow up. Then we have rapid growth and lots of palatability, like soft, supple, delicious, nice salad greens that our grazing animals are going to be really excited about. But then as we get uh, into higher stages of growth, it's starting to get a bit more woody. We're getting more lignin into the plant. And so the digestible elements, your animals are going to spend more time digesting um, things that aren't providing them as much energy or nutrition. And then, of course, at some point we hit that peak where um, we're not having growth and actually the plants turning its energy more into seed formation and the nutrient values tend to level off or decline at that point, right? So everything that you're grazing is going through this and the challenge is throughout the season and depending on the time of year, this curve and the timing of this is going to look really different. So our ideal with all of our paddocks is as we go through this uh, cycle from left to right here, we're getting an increase in yield, meaning the volume of material per acre. You know, we want our maximum amount ideally in there, right? Because we want to feed our animals. 
of course, as that yield goes up, the quality of it is going down. So we're trying to hit the intersection of those two points and get our animals in during that, harvest that, and then move on to the next paddock. That's, that's the ideal that we will be constantly working towards uh, for the rest of our lives on our farm. So folks mentioned grazing height. So if you're new to this, you know, one general rule of thumb is, is hitting that kind of perfect intersection is bring the animals in around 10 to 12 inches of, you know, average height of the vegetation in there and bring them off at four inches. Some people say two inches. I think the recommendation to avoid any sort of parasite cycling is more like four inches. So no more than two inches, ideally four inches or, or again, by that third, you know, third day. But, you know, we try to move our animals every, every day. That's really our, our general goal. And depending on the size of your flock, that can be more or less practical or not. So this is our first year of grazing here. We just had a a handful of sheep and it wasn't practical to move them every day and, and it wasn't practical to have paddocks that were you know optimally sized for that perfect eat everything and then we'll move you the next day and so we had to kind of compromise there um, we've had times in our lives where we we've been too busy to imagine moving them once a day and so we set that up and think about ways that we can you know do our best within these kind of confines so that's a good kind of rule of thumb to start with in terms of the in terms of the height all right, so we're going to talk a little bit about planning, and uh, there's a warning here. There's a little bit of math coming. Now, don't feel like if uh, I struggle personally with doing these calculations and, and sort of keeping them in my head. So if it starts to make your head spin, just know that um, this, this information is out there, but I want to use it for illustrative purposes now to give you some things to think about. If you want a specific walkthrough of all these uh, calculations, um, it is in the Civil Pasture book, and this is where the figures that I'm going to share are coming from, but the formulas are not unique to us. We use them from NRCS. They're in uh, Sarah Flack's book. I mean, they're in a lot of different resources to help, but I want to emphasize that doing some calculations is not so that you get, quote unquote, the right answer, but you start to hone in on a set of parameters that you can then use as a reference point to kind of check yourself over time just my kind of math, not perfect, but definitely helping me get somewhere a little bit um, better. So again, these calculations, when we think about dry matter per acre, and we're looking at that, that's mostly really thinking about utilizing that as 100% for our grazing ruminants. So if your interest is also or uh, focused on pigs or poultry, just know there's other resources out there that are thinking about ways to do these calculations. A lot of people also will take these grazing calcs and consider that as like a 20 to 60% amount of feed intake and kind of play with that number um, over time to figure out how they can maximize the growth of their animals, the production of their animals, and also the, the grazing, right? So I um, really recommend Sugar Mountain Farm if you're into pigs, amazing articles and resources there. Um, and an article I pulled offline that had some good information about pastured, pastured poultry there and, and what the landscape could look like. But there's a little more dependency there again because of the ways and often what we're with pigs and poultry worried more about is manure accumulation and sort of overgrazing or, or impacting the vegetation too much. So um, that can be a really important indicator in terms of how to move and how big to make paddocks and things like that. All right, so the four things you need, four pieces of information you're gonna need to do these calculations is one, the length of your grazing season. Um, for the purposes of these calcs that, again, I just copied them from the book, I could make comments about if that was a good choice or not. The length of the grazing season. We in Central New York could graze theoretically from April 1st to November 1st. That's a highly optimistic <laughs> projection um, based on some experiences we've had in the past few years. This year, we actually grazed um, well close to December 1st, uh, but we didn't start grazing till uh, a little bit later in the season. Um, some years, it can really vary. So this is, again, something that's actually really useful for you to keep track of. When's the first day I put my animals on pasture? When's the first day I'm taking them off, right? Um, and starting to feed hay and feeding hay for us in the fall is really a 50-50. A they're eating some hay and they're still eating as much green stuff as they can until it's kind of gone. So keep that in mind. And that's a variable. All these variables you can more or less play with, right? So that's number one. Number two, average weight of your animals. There's a lot of ways that um, uh, <laughs> you can do this calculation. So for this, I'm keeping it simple. I'm saying we have mature ewes. For us, our mature ewes average about 90 pounds a piece. Some people will say, I'm going to do my mature ewes, I'm going to do my ram lambs and my lambs, I'm going to do them all separate, I'm going to build a spreadsheet and have all those different weights and, and do the math, right? So there's different ways and, and you can complexify these calculations. But for now, we're just going to say, we're grazing mature ewes, they're 90 pounds a piece. We're going to need to know daily utilization. And generally speaking, NRCS recommends 4% of body weight, and that's really for any grazing animal. Um, 
that is a ruminant. You can just take their body weight, whatever their average body weight is, and, and say 4% of that is a good place to start. There's a lot of ranges out there from three. I've seen from 3% to 6%. So you can play with that again. Um, there's different assumptions with that, but 4% is a pretty good safe number to work with. And then finally, you need to know your annual slash maybe seasonal uh, yields of pounds per acre. This is the big variable. This is the what. This is kind of the rabbit hole you can go down, depending on how you want to choose um, to do this and to play with it to again increase your understanding, not to get the right answer, because it's always dynamic. So. Each pasture, a patch in your pasture, I'm, I'm differentiating a patch of pasture from a paddock. This is not our paddock map. This is a patch map we did. What we call paddock patches <laughs> are just areas we're going to put paddocks into, but we're going to not think about where we're drawing the boxes for our fencing. We're looking at the quality of those patches from a grazing perspective. And there are all sorts of graze. Uh, uh, pasture scoring templates. The USDA has a ton of them. Most of them, I think, overly complex. A lot of people don't complete them because there's too much information. I like the red light, green light, yellow light scoring, <laughs> which is really just considering the different qualities, considering the observations I have and my, my family has and other people working with us on the farm. Where do we see as our highest quality pastures? Where's our lowest quality pastures and what are kind of in between? And so we make this map every few years and and uh, it's really based off our observations. And it's enough for us to kind of work off of. But just keep in mind that this is the, the challenge with calculations is they're gonna impose uniformity where there is only uh, mixture and only diversity. So when you think about calculating dry matter per acre, you could go into your best pass paddocks, you could go into your medium ones, you could go into your low ones, you could do a sample of all three. There's a lot of different ways, again, depending on time and energy you want to do, how accurate you want to get. There are tools here. This is an example from Ohio State of different ways you can measure uh, in the field and take samples and actually do the math to figure out your dry matter per acre. Um, and different kind of pros and cons for those. Um, we've done those, but not as much as just kind of estimating. So there's charts out there. The chart on the top is showing the dry matter per acre range for per one inch of, of forage. So you could say, I'm assuming I'm going to put all my animals in at 10 inches and I'm going to multiply each of these by 10 and pick something in the range. Um, uh, the, the chart uh, in, at the bottom is from the book. This is more of doing some math and kind of calculating um, uh, that ideal pasture mix of like 75% grass and 25% legume. And then in the book, we go into this. We also kind of buffered everything by reducing the numbers a bit. So we're kind of being a little more pessimistic than we want to be because what we want to do is assume that some years are going to be droughty and we're not going to have as much of this perfect scenario. And I think it's always good to underestimate and have more than to overestimate and suddenly have more animals and, and not enough forage growing in those in those really hard years. So again, a lot of detail we're not going to get into in the webinar, just to be aware, this is kind of where you pull these numbers from and you can get into a lot of nuance with um, these, you can see there's a lot of ranges of here. There's a lot of, you know, fair, what's fair pasture versus good versus excellent. So, you know, read up on that and give a sense of it uh, in, in the way that you might want to calculate. I want to focus on the 3,087. That's what we determined was our average per acre production per year um, in this scenario when I get to some of the calculations. The other thing we did in the book is we looked at um, different uh, types of forages uh, and that, again, that annual average, but then the percent allocation in different times of the year, because this is not like you're getting all of this pasture evenly spread. And that's one of the things new grazers are often surprised is suddenly you have so much potential pasture in the spring and then kind of dries up in the summer, you know, generally speaking, at least in the, the cooler temperate climates. I know in other climates, you all can share the different patterns, right? There's these different patterns of when this forage actually can show up in our landscape. So if we want to, if, you know, ask this question, I have this many acres, what's my carrying capacity? We can take all this information. You can see one of those, you're going to have to chew on a bit and, and play with some different numbers. Take the number of acres that you have. What's that forage per acre value that you've decided? And you, you multiply those two together. You divide that by the intake percent, the average animal weight, and your grazing days. And that gives you your carrying capacity. So for us, in this example, we actually have more pasture now. Um, we were just, uh, uh, this, was, this was back <laughs> many years ago now, 15 acres. We did that average value. We did the intake, and we got about 60 animals as our carrying capacity. Okay, great. That gives us some information. 
then we got to question what kind of assumptions we had in here and is are we really pushing it with 60 animals we found over time that that is really pushing it um, um, and, and again the quality of these acres is is quite different so it gives us something to work with we can calculate the say i have a set number of animals i think i want to graze i've done an enterprise budget and i say i want to graze you know x amount of sheep or x amount of cattle what do i need in terms of land right so again i can play with these variables number of animals i want to do their average weight the intake the grazing days multiply all that together divide it by the available forage per acre and then we get how many acres we might need so in this case i was um uh, working with specifically that year 42 sheep um and got about I, I needed about 10 acres of land in order to manage that and so these are actually comparable in the sense that that last calculation said i could have 60 sheep on this 15 acres this is saying i only need 10 acres for this 42 sheep and so for me that gave me a little bit of a, a window to to have some confidence that this was giving me a range of of, of a good carrying capacity so again, all these things change depending on your climate where you are. You may be utilizing both cool and warm season grasses or just one or the other. Legumes often tend to show up and be a bit of a modifier, but we're going to have these peaks in these valleys in the um, seasonality of how these things go. I think the most useful one of those, I think those other two give you a sense if you're trying to, uh, I work with clients a lot and they're like, I think I want to graze 20 sheep and I have this five acres. And so we go through the calcs and they realize that that's probably not a realistic expectation. Maybe more like X amount of sheep is a realistic expectation. When it comes down to actually doing our, our grazing plan, what we find most useful is actually calculating the paddock size and looking at how that size of paddock might want to change or how we might want to manage differently throughout those different high points and low points in the season in terms of forage. So if you want to calculate the paddock size, average animal weight, intake, number of animals, available forage per acre, all right? And so when we did this with 50 sheep um, and assuming 800 pounds an acre, this is springtime. We looked at that chart, looked at what we would expect in May or something like that. We only need a quarter of an acre, essentially, to keep these sheep fed in the spring. When we look at the summer values, some of the lowest values possible, 300 pounds per acre, we're going to need half an acre in order to, to feed those sheep. And so you could design a grazing plan that looks differently in the spring versus in the summer. And some people do that. We went kind of in the middle and we said, we're just going to design half acre paddocks because that's easy for us to understand, keep our heads around. We can alter the duration a bit. That gives us a day or two. We can move them. And and we'll see, we're gonna just start with half acre paddocks. And what we did is we drew this out on um, Google Earth, uh, which is a great free program. And you can you know, draw out your boxes and then um, um, calculate the, the acreage very easily. So we kind of got rough uniform sizes. Now you can see on here, there's a lot of variation in here. Some of these are full woodland paddocks. Some of these are full pasture paddocks. Some of these are somewhere in between. Some of these you couldn't tell from here, but they're in wet areas. So we do not utilize all of these. There's about 40, 45 paddocks, I think. We do not utilize all of these uniformly throughout the season. We tend to um, skip some depending on the year or step into some depending on the year. So good examples last year. There's a lot of this acreage in the open pasture that we skipped because as we did our first rotation, we harvested that spring uh, uh, grass growth, but then it wasn't coming back with a sufficient recovery for us to go back at a normal time with oh we went through all 45 paddocks we're back to you know paddock eight or whatever so we skipped it and we'd go somewhere else and in this case we spent a lot of time up in the woods here and these are areas we're actively converting to civil pasture so that's another variable to that um, dry matter calculation is an open pasture you saw those charts those are fair good or excellent for open pasture when you get into civil pasture you might even have to put those into half or or 75 percent if you're getting really good uh, healthy regrowth and you fully thin the woods and you're getting enough light you know into that understory so it gets it can get complicated i don't feel like for our goals we need to get it perfect this has helped us tremendously in getting some general sizes some reference points and then we reflect on this every year we've changed this map every year so again we kind of look at it we do that pasture scoring map every few years we do the paddock map every year this is also a really helpful orientation tool for our staff that comes on and helps us graze, gets them up to speed. They can ask questions about the different paddocks and we can understand what's going on with our grazing system. And that's really what it's all about. It's not about getting it all perfect. It's about having tools for you to, 
take some notes, reflect on it, make some changes over time. So um, last piece of this Grazing 101 is a couple steps that some of the things that we found to be most beneficial for us to focus on when we think about just improving things overall. Um, and some of these may apply to you if you're uh, only just new to this uh, and some you may be familiar with and some may, might be a, a helpful addition. I hope I hope everyone finds a few in here that are that are useful for them. So um, the first thing is if you're new to this and you're you want to have some animals, well, fine, do some calculations and start with a, a small number of animals under your carrying capacity, well under your carrying capacity, and just start moving them. Just get some fencing. Um, we did not have any permanent fencing uh, for the first seven years that we grazed. We just did electronet fencing. And good Lord, when we first um, started, I will say, we uh, spent a lot of time moving fence, rolling up fence, getting fence tangled on things, getting really frustrated. We learned over the first few seasons how to roll the fence, how to move the fence. And we got really good at it. And so now it's not actually that big of a chore. Um, we don't mind it. It's a little challenging in the civil pastures when we have woody stuff sticking out of the ground, but we've learned how to deal with that as well. But um, you just got to kind of uh, get, get your feet wet, right? So for us, a manageable size for the first year, we got four bre bread ewes and they each had, you know, one or two lambs. And, th and that was what we kind of worked with for the first first year. And, and then we kind of grew exponentially from there. And then we kind of hit our peak and then you know, we, we kind of came back down in the last few years. So always find, trying to find that, that that happy point there. So start under your carrying capacity and just do rotations. Know that some of that area may just not be grazed, which is fine. And because you're not necessarily keeping up carrying capacity, theoretically, if you're keeping up, you're keeping all your pastures, you know, grazed, but you're going to have to do some mowing uh, as part of this. Second thing we, I think, learned and is, is always valuable is if you're going to do rotational grazing, you got to have at least... Um, the next paddock, if not the next two or three paddocks set up. What we like to do is every Monday is paddock setup day. We have enough fencing. I mean, when we started, we had enough fencing for one paddock, right? This, this picture here. So when it was time to move them to the next paddock, um, you can see there's the next paddock in the background. That's actually our, our chicken, <laughs> chicken fencing. Um, you know, we had to kind of like corral the sheep into a little corner and and then free up a few fences and then kind of move the next thing. It took a ton of time just from that perspective. When we got smarter, we realized we, if we just buy enough fence, it's a good investment. Uh, it lasts for many years. Now we can set up two paddocks at a time. And then we're not reliant on our, our, our schedules and our realities of life as to when we move the animals. The, the paddock is there waiting for the animals to be moved at that perfect time because it only takes me a minute to open up the fence and have the animals go through, but it might take me an hour to set up the, the paddock fence, right? So if I'm working uh, part-time, full-time, that's what we've been doing all these years we've been grazing, it's sometimes nice to just come home after work and know you can just move the animals into the next paddock. So get two or three next paddocks set up and have yourself ready to go from the get-go. And then you can move based on what the grasses and the animals need, not based on your schedule. Definitely, um, plan to mow. I think when we got into grazing, we thought, hey, we're not going to have to graze, uh, sorry, mow at all. Uh, this is great. <laughs> it's not true. <laughs> so in, in the first initial passes of your pasture, they're going to leave behind stuff that they don't like. Uh, thistles are <laughs> an easy example, but there's a lot of other things that'll show up. If you do not clip those things, you've now created a really nice habitat for many of those to persist, spread their seed, uh, and and carry on. And thistle is kind of one of the ones that I love it for uh, ecological and a wildlife value. But if I know that seed's going to drift into pasture and start to create, create problems, it's one of those things that every um, late summer I'm going around, I, I like to let it flower, but then clip it before any of that seed is developing because it can be really persistent once it gets established. Um, so clipping after grazing is a really important practice when you're getting started. Over time, you do tend to be able to reduce that. You do not tend to be able to reduce the fact that you probably have to clip your pastures after that spring flush of growth because stuff is just going to get out of hand and and unless you have extra animals suddenly showing up and then leaving for the summer, you're probably not going to get to everything. It's going to get too woody and you're going to want to cut it back down and and get it to regenerate so that you have enough pasture to hit you through that summer slump when stuff isn't going to grow back nearly as fast, right? So mowing is going to be a part of this and, and mowing can also equate to haying. That's what a lot of folks will do is 
um, is hay that first cutting of their pasture because their animals aren't able to consume it, but then they can put it up for, for use at a later time, right? And so that's a really important factor to consider. How am I going to follow those animals and not, um, not just assume that because they went through the paddock that we're all good and we can move on? I think myself, as well as a lot of other folks I've known in the grazing world, have um, become real big proponents, big fans of bale grazing. Um, and bale grazing, really, just broadly speaking, is the practice of uh, taking our, our 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 hay, which again we are in our case buying in. It's not economic for us, uh, and the, our landscape really doesn't support <laughs> very much haying. Um, but we buy that in from a neighbor and we see that also as a fertility input. We're bringing that, that, that nutrition onto the landscape. And if we strategically put these bales in certain areas and we let the animals graze them, they're not going to graze everything. So there's a mulch factor. They're going to pass seed through their gut and also drop it on the ground. So there's a seeding factor. There's a um, trampling factor from the animals being there. So areas that we want to regenerate or create really healthy pasture, throwing the bales in there and getting the animals in at the right time and getting them out at the right time is really an effective, low cost way to do this. Um, and it also reduces the, the issues with feeding out hay in a lot where you just have all this stuff building up. You're distributing it around the landscape. So for us, we graze as long as we can. And then we bale graze essentially as long as we can until the snow and the frozen ground is prohibiting us from putting fence up. We are putting these animals around our landscape and continuing to rotate them on slower rotations, but adding the, the bales in and doing bale grazing. We look for those targeted areas that we want to have the hoof impact of the animals, have the impact of spreading this material. And I'll give you one example here. This, this is an extreme example because this was a building site that we had several years ago. We got some... Um, moderately good, <laughs> pretty low quality round bales from our neighbor. Did have some clover seed in them, which is great. He gave them to us at a deal because they were they were a little little poor, too poor quality for his for his wife's horses, and so dropped them off. We rolled them out. Uh, this was after again a building project, so pretty bare, uh, com slightly compacted soil um, that we wanted to reseed and get ready for the next year. So this is in October. Roll the bales out. We look for those opportunity, those times when it's wet, but not too wet. We get the animals in there. They are trampling, okay? And before they get in there, we are seeding. So what we did in this mix was a winter rye. Um, we did a little bit of clover as well, but we tended to save the clover for frost seeding in the spring. We mostly put down winter rye in here, and we got them in these smaller little areas uh, that we wanted them to trample that seed in. And then start working at these bales. And because the bales are kind of moderate quality, they only ate maybe two thirds of the bale. There's a lot of material left. Of course, we have to come back and kind of spread out the lump that they leave behind. Mulch over all the seed. We had nice germination of the of the winter rye. We didn't leave them in there long enough so that they started to mud it up. Um, so we had to make the paddock sizes small enough that they would hit one or two of these bales and then we'd get them out of there spread the hay out, and then we had really nice pasture regeneration um, the following season and enough bare space that we could still do frost seeding, which is generally with legume plants, you can bring them in and, and broadcast seed um, as the seasons are changing. Like usually here, it's like February and March, and we can get really good pasture establishment by using the animals, timing things, and using the bales. That's just one good example of bale grazing. Um, um, the other thing I'd say is a, is a really good recommendation is uh, planning for times without um, when you're not going to have active forage. Just that's just the reality of grazing. Unless you're doing an operation where you're bringing in the animals in the spring and you're selling them all in the fall and and taking the winter off. So what are we going to do with the animals and how do we put them to work in a in a restorative or regenerative way? Their activity, their interest. What does that look like? So. Um, I say on here, you know, we, our goal is to not have quote unquote sacrifice pastures. Sacrifice pastures are often talked about in grazing as this place where you just kind of let stuff go um, to the wayside. It becomes a muddy mess, that sort of thing. I think that kind of impact is sometimes inevitable and that sometimes happens. That's fine. But that can be seen as a restorative act if you want to regenerate a, a really degraded part of pasture. So, so there's different ways to look at that same activity. If you're going to follow that up with seeding or grading or earthworks or all sorts of different things, maybe that's a positive impact. But if you're just letting them hit a spot every year and just kind of beating it up, um, you're not getting any, any change out of that. So we always try to think about where can we put our animals? What can we do that could be a positive effect on the land long term? This is an example here. Um, 
we call this a living barn. This is kind of an outdoor woods area. This is an area that's not going to be thin for civil pasture. It's actually really nicely sheltered. It's well drained. It provides a lot of good um, protection for our sheep in the winter. And um, there's a lot of understory vegetation that's undesirable. And so what we do is we bale graze in here. And of course, the sheep, um, after an hour, they're like done with the bale and they're looking around wondering what to do. And so they start stripping the um, younger trees here or the or the invasive shrubbery that we want to remove from this site. And they'll spend all their time kind of stripping that little bits of bark off and they're helping us thin out this woods um, just as, as something that they're interested in doing and is actually beneficial for them, right? So again, combination of bale grazing and some boredom, you know, starts to create and shape the ecosystems um, as we see it. And then these became more places where we did more permanent winter paddocks because we realized the shade and shelter and sort of uh, shelter from storm event uh, benefits that we we started to realize with this. And if you go to our YouTube channel, there's a, a video of the fencing system we use. This was an old pine plantation. And one of the beautiful parts of this that we kind of stumbled across was we could use the trees that are planted in straight rows uh, a lot as fence posts. Um, and this was something I thought was a, always a terrible idea because all the farms I've worked on, all the landscapes I've worked on, of course, someone's stapled a, you know, length of barbed wire to a tree. And we know, we all know what happens to that. The tree grows over it. It creates a mess. It, it does damage to the tree, that sort of thing. Um, but now um, several folks have come up with different innovative ways to attach fencing to trees without doing damage to the tree. And this can be a really great use for these kind of um, edgy habitats uh, or, um, hedgerows, things like that, where you can actually put put the trees to work in that sense. Um, you're not going to put these on your highest quality trees, but um, if you want to watch that video, you'll see the technique there. There's You can kind of see it in the photo where there's a board and there's a, a galvanized nail with a fender washer, which just creates a situation where as the tree grows, it kind of pushes the board out uh, instead of if you attach fencing right to the tree, it'll suck the, the wire right in. And if you're on our YouTube channel, hey, you should subscribe while you're there. We're trying to our goal now is to get a thousand followers. We'd love if y'all did it today, we'd be well over that mark. So help us out. Uh, we're going to post a lot of videos this year about um, grazing stuff and, and mushrooms. That's a commitment we have for the year is to keep increasing the content. All right. And then the final thing I want to promote, of course, always, uh, and these are other, there are other talks on this. If you want to check it out on the YouTube channel, on the facts webinar series is, is I think a big part of pasture improvement is, is tree planting. Um, is adding trees to pasture strategically, um, thinking really carefully about the species of trees, the spatial arrangement of those trees, the ways that can work with our fencing and our paddocks um, so we don't create more work for ourselves, but we actually create really nice diverse habitats. I have a personal interest in the fodder value, the leaf material that we can harvest from these trees and, and what that brings to grazing livestock, but just the value of the shade and the shelter of the trees can be really important um, for animal welfare and, and productivity. And so that alone is useful. Then you can also, of course, grow trees that have other you know, potential secondary products. Um, but there's a big difference between having a, a chestnut orchard with grazing that's, a, that's managing a grazing system and a chestnut orchard versus having a, a stand of black locust or um, poplar or willow that is more for the grazing and supporting the grazing animals. Because in the chestnut orchard, you're managing the chestnut also as a crop. So it's kind of all that labor and intensity. With adding trees to pasture, I think of it as managing as part of the grazing operation. And I, we, we see the marked benefits of this from a lot of different angles. And so you're not going to necessarily plant trees on every single acre of pasture, but usually the marginal spaces, the edges, the wet spots, there's lots of different uh, opportunities to bring trees in. And I think there's just um, far too many benefits to even get into now. So um, from a fodder perspective, I'll just share a little teaser. And we did do a fodder tree fodder webinar in the past. If you want to dig that up, um, it's on the YouTube channel that gets into this in more detail. But these are the four most uh, common fodder species for cool temperate climates. Now, in a lot of the other climates as well, we see mulberry and, and, and different popl poplar and willow varietals will also thrive. So kind of wherever you are, you can start to work with those three at least. And then maybe if black locust isn't appropriate for your area, there's some kind of um, nitrogen fixing legume species that is uh, native or present in your bioregion. And that's kind of the analog for black locust. So, so wherever you are, you can kind of start to utilize and play with these. And when I did research for the book, I wanted to find species that were broad enough and adaptable enough that there's a lot of variants that you can start to play with. And I think these have 
yeah, these are a great place to start um, if you want to bring trees into your into your grazing system. All right, so lots of lots of stuff there. I love to um, field some questions. Um, in addition to the Silva Pasture book, if that's of interest to you, I really want to highly recommend Sarah Flack's book, The Art and Science of Grazing. And I know Sarah's done some webinars with fact in the past as well, but that's one of the better, you know, I specifically, when I wrote Silva Pasture, I was like, I'm not going to rewrite a chapter on grazing because there's already this awesome book to reference. And so, um, yeah, hopefully y'all can build build better pastures and better grazing systems and appreciate your your attention. Awesome. Thank you, Steve. Sam, did you want to say something? I was just going to say, just a reminder, if you want Steve to answer your questions, make sure you put them in the Q&A. I've noticed some people have put them in the chat. We may not get to them if they're in the chat because it's um, we've got a lot of a lot going on in the chat. Yes, the chat is ongoing. So um, we do probably have about five or 10 minutes. Um, I know that we're already at the hour, but Steve is gracious enough to stick around to answer some of the questions um, in the q and A. I am going to pull up a short um, poll. This is just to give us some feedback about the webinar. So as we're kind of um, starting to ask some of the questions, feel free to please fill that out. It should only take you, I don't know, probably about five seconds. OK, so going into the chat, Sam, do you want to go do the first one? Sure. So uh, another Steve <laughs> would like to know, please comment on mob grazing to attempt the control of annual weeds, carrying capacity versus time on the size of pasture. Um, yeah, I think mob grazing has a lot of different definitions for different people. It is, it is what I'm most familiar with um, is actually looking at the weight of your animals and sort of the impact and doing these sort of very intensive, very short duration events in order to, it's it's essentially back to the comment I had about sort of disturbance as a, as a factor in grazing, right? So you're kind of maximizing that, but you're maximizing that disturbance with weight. And it's often associated with cattle at a very high stocking density at very low durations to make a, a big change to that pasture. Um, and so I think, um, I think it's a really viable strategy. It's one of these things. And again, no one should take any of these as the way to do it. It's, it's like another variation on, you know, it's like having a screwdriver and you have like four different flathead screwdrivers for different situations. It's, it's an important thing to consider if you have that. It hasn't been something we've done a lot of because we were working with sheep and they just aren't that heavy. <laughs> and we definitely notice we can't do as much with them because we don't get that trampling effect. And so it's not as applicable to us. And and I want to relate this to a question Travis said um, about, he said, I disagree with having a more clip pasture. Um, I didn't do it at all last year. My weed pressure actually helped my grass. It allowed for shade and moisture to sit under these plants and all the good stuff grew underneath it. So that's a really good example where um, I don't want to say that you always have to clip and you should always clip every year or every pasture. It's, it's a, again, another tool that's situationally really appropriate. In dry and drought seasons or in really dry climates, leaving some of that stubble can actually help in your grass regeneration. And so um, I hope folks don't take any of any of the things I say. This is the prescription, but it's more of a of, of an option, right? Yeah, thank you, Steve. So another question: um, context being with drought moving from west to east, what management practices can you recommend to improve the grass for grazing? I, I missed the first half. So with drought. Well, with drought, I think becoming kind of a, a bigger factor it's mm. all across the country. Well, so um, we need we need with these we need longer rest and recovery periods. Um, I think that we can identify. Uh, we've started to identify pasture patches that do better in the droughty years, and it's been really interesting. One of the things I will say, very anecdotally, is that all of the pastures closest to our barns and kind of the main farm, we've also been rotationally grazing chickens or ducks or both for many years. And I am struck at how, no matter what the season, how those tend to rebound almost twice as fast as many of other pastures as we get further afield. And I think that um, having those multi-species benefits, especially the poultry having a lot of phosphorus that they're adding to the system, mm -hmm a lot more just animals on the landscape, a lot more water retention, all those kind of things will add up. So I think a good strategy is to 
consider what pastors are already doing well in those drier years, like more well than the other, you know, the, the kind of ranking those again, the, the red light, green light, yellow light, and then thinking about ways you can potentially amplify those pastures. So you have some, um, some available pasture for those dry times. You have a plan for that. And that then again, you have to step back and say, well, what's my carrying capacity? If I'm thinking in a drought year, I actually only have, you know, 50% of my pastures I can rely on. So what is my carrying capacity then? Because, you know, I don't know what yet next year is going to bring. It, for us, it feels like in New York, it's like every year is like the driest and then the wettest and then the dry, you know, so, <laughs> and, and again, maybe your plan is to, um, to stockpile hay and feed out hay and do bale grazing and build up pasture capacity that way. You just have to have a plan and, and think about that. Um, but we know it's coming, right? So I think that's been our strategy to identify those, those pastures that are doing the best and then think about how to continuously enhance them. I also think that um, another great benefit of trees and civil pasture concepts is they're providing a, a, a moderating effect on a given patch or paddock where you can get uh, recovery and retention of good forages, even in some of the hotter um, or drier years, which can be really good. So I know folks that do silver pasture, and mostly they save that for the dry times of the year or the dry years, mm -hmm. and and that that's when they really get the value. That's always when it when it the rubber hits the road, so to speak. Richard actually agrees with you. He said that he has a mobile chicken coop that follows the grazing rotation. It's made a big difference in the quality and recovery of his forage. So the next question I've got is from Jeffrey. Um, any suggestions for breaking up deep hard pan from haying? Yeah, I mean, it I guess it depends on how deep. <laughs> uh, we've, I definitely, um, we're doing a lot of tree planting projects uh, now with um, some, excuse me, larger poultry farms in the area. And we're doing a lot of subsoiling before we, we plant the trees. Um, that's one of the easiest things to start with. And it also is really essential if you're gonna add trees to, to compacted pastures um, because they'll hit that hard pan and then they'll really struggle to, most most species will really struggle to work through it. Um, so I think that's really valuable. I do think that uh, we can we can also think depending on the depth of the hard pan and what we're working with, we can always be building capacity in the top layer of soil. So if that top layer of soil is there, if we're not necessarily experiencing a negative impact to that, we can still build organic matter in the top soil and just through good rotational grazing have a positive effect. So it it, it kind of comes down to the equipment and intensity that you want to um, want to work with and how much that's actually affecting. That may not always be the source of your your woes, you know, uh, and may not be worth the energy to to try to break up. But you know, we, there's not a ton of options at a broad scale other than uh, getting an implement down there to try to break it up and, and create some channels into those into those hard pans and then the long slow game of of rotational grazing adding adding species diversity that sort of thing thanks steve uh there are a couple of questions uh, along in this theme um wondering if you could speak a little bit more about shelter and water um and what you do with those in, in your more remote remote areas where you're rotating to yeah, so we did a webinar on water, didn't we? That was one. <laughs> that was one that we we talked about in various ways. I think um, one of the reasons we chose sheep on our on our landscape was um, have I, just before coming here, I was working with um, a small cattle operation, and um, I was just blown away by the water needs. <laughs> and rotational grazing became harder because of that. Um, and it was really a it's 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 wonderful when the grasses are wet and sort of in in the growing season how little water the sheep need um, and that's a big factor our our ducks when we were rotationally grazing ducks needed twice the water our sheep did you know it always felt kind of out of balance but that's what it is um, and so we were able to just put our we have our like our plow truck and we put a, a cube tank on the back filled up with water from either a pond or our well and kind of drive that around and and we had a few different water wagons over time. Um, there's definitely areas and over time, I, I think a, a good long-term investment is, is, um, is putting in pipe. It's, it's a, it's a cheap way to bring water around to the farm where you need it, when you need it. And I think for the investment, it's a really good, good return long-term. If you're, if you're planning on doing the grazing, you know, you can't really beat it having a, having to frost your hydrant where you need it. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, okay. Sammy, so I'm 
maybe take the last one because we're getting late. Well, I'm actually, uh, there's so many good questions, you guys. This is always the way it is. I know. Um, but I skipped a few. And um, this is, I think this is a really good question. And it's something that we, I feel like in the webinars, we don't talk enough about. Um, but um, this is from Noah Rennells, who actually is in North Carolina. And I know him, but I'm not choosing it because I know Noah. I'm choosing it because I think it's a good question. Um, he would like you to kindly comment on the enterprise labor needs needed for various management options and where the sweet spot is what number of animals moving them often with lots of fencing and occasional moving results in strong profits and and i think that we miss we, i don't think we ask that enough when we're talking to people because it's almost like we're trying to get information not necessarily the realities of how do you make your bottom line work yeah i mean that's that sweet spot is everybody's everybody's uh spot to discover i guess right so i think that um we we initially got sheep because again we wanted to manage our pastures and then we said let's let's really turn this into an enterprise that might be the central one we do for the farm and then actually now in the last few years we've we've backed off a bit because it became a little more intense and we're kind of pushing literally pushing the carrying capacity of the landscape to the point where we were we were barely keeping we were sort of like barely keeping up in terms of our forage production and our labor and all the kind of like <laughs> when you have too many <laughs> ram lambs especially and they're growing they just have such a voracious appetite i feel like i would go out there to check on them in the evening and be like oh you guys got to move again are you kidding me like they're just were so <laughs> ready and it, it was that year that we we're like wait maybe we're really pushing this too much where it feels like we can't keep up right so i guess there's like that sense of like can i keep up with the way i want to interact i love we have a young uh, baby now like i love strapping the baby on and like going and moving fence that works for me and so that can integrate into our lives. And if it can, we, if my wife and I between us can move fence one or two hours a week and keep up with the grazing needs, that's, that's a sweet spot in my mind. Right. So I think that's one piece. And then the, 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 the profitability question is really interesting because we've been selling uh, custom cuts of lamb for a long time. We've never really gone into retail individual cuts because we don't want to spend the time at market or sort of doing that. And we may change that direction in future years, but um, the real value we see of the sheep is their impact on the entire landscape of our farm and how much they're changing the ecological um, structure and the health and the function of that landscape. Like that's higher value than anything we can get from selling lamb. And we, we still don't know how to actually <laughs> fully quantify the value that brings um, and how much the farm has been improved because of their presence there. So. So we went from something that said, we're going to have a, a lamb enterprise that the goal is to sell lamb and see those dollars come into saying, well, that is a portion of it that feels like it offsets labor costs. But our main value is the ecological function of those animals on the landscape. Because um, as folks know, with with livestock farming, the margins are thin and there's got you have to have a really good strategy for how those things are going to be um lined up so that you're you're getting to to meet your goals, right? And ultimately for us, our goals led us to say we want to make sure that the sheep are getting to all parts of the land that we're able to keep up like I said in terms of wanting to move fence as much as we did every week and then um, our farm does other things that we kind of like ramp up for that cash flow piece so so for us it's really important that the all the farm enterprises are part of an ecosystem themselves and they don't all have to be like pedal to the metal bring in the dollars right they have different functions um and so it, it's but it's important the whole farm kind of works as a as a viable thing so yeah that's how i answer that question how, can you give us an idea of how many sheep you're raising yeah so at, at max we had um 70 ish grazing during the peak season we were breeding 30 yeah about 30 30 35 um and then we we just backed off we actually took a year off from breeding which was an amazing Highly recommend this. Try it out sometime because we knew we were having a baby and we were just need we needed a break. So we just called our herd down to twelve of our best and and are now breeding those for next year. But last year we just had twelve animals, which was amazing in a drought. We didn't have to worry about anything. Um, obviously there was no there was really sort of no profitability. It took it took a year off from that on our on our budget, but um, but boy it was it was such a joy. Um, and and it was a, a beautiful benefit we had too. Is the uh, we had all these. Um, 
replacement ewes that we would have had to call that we could keep for one more season to graze because we weren't asking them to to birth again. So some of our earliest sheep, the ones we got the first year, were able to take one more season, one more loop around the pasture, <laughs> you know, and enjoy that um, because of that. So so there's benefits then. I think as farmers, we we need to recognize that we can't just grind every year after year, and it's okay to take take a break. And um, yeah, so so we're kind of like building back up and. I think our sweet spot for us is around um, is around forty to fifty grazing animals during the season. Awesome. Um, uh, can you? There's just. Can you go back two slides um, to the Sarah Flack book? No, Larissa says. Don't I you? well, it's different. It's a different screen. This is a. This is the book. It's if you can see. Oh man, the art and science of grazing. I think that's what people are asking about. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, we're on a different slideshow right now. We sorry. I'll see over. if I can pull it up real quick. Pull a link yeah. up. Yes, awesome. It's a highly recommended book for sure. It's very accessible. Um, well, I am sorry to say that we are just about out of time, but the good news is Steve will be back with us several more times this year or this winter. So that's awesome. Keep those questions coming. Um, a reminder that a recording of the webinar and the slides will be available. I'm going to be sending them out via email. Um, hopefully later today if everything goes as planned and then they'll also be posted on our on our website and our um, YouTube channel as well. Um, check out some of the other webinars we have coming up. We just announced one for next week actually about uh, Mayshawn Hogs and lots of other ones throughout the, um, uh, February and March. I will be sending out uh, links to the registration pages for each of those as well. So thank you, Steve. It's really an honor and a pleasure to have you back with us. And I'm looking forward to being with you again um, next month and in, in March. And then thank you, Samantha, for for helping out today and um, being with me behind the scenes. It's always fun to have to have uh, have you involved. And then everyone else in the audience, we love all the interaction that's going on in the chats. We love your questions. Thank you for, you know, Absolutely. trying to figure out how to, how this all makes sense for your situation, your operation. I know it's it's it, it is an art and a science. So thank you for your hard work, and um, that we'll see you again on future sessions. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Bye, everybody.